Hi everyone, and welcome to Remaking Tomorrow, a series of conversations about the future of teaching and learning. I'm Ryan Radzeski, here with Greg Baer, and we're the co-authors of When You Wonder, You're Learning, Mr. Rogers' Enduring Lessons for Raising Creative, Curious, Caring Kids. This is a podcast powered by Remake Learning, a network that ignites engaging, relevant, and equitable learning in support of young people navigating rapid social and technological change. On today's episode, we're talking with Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond, president and CEO of the Learning Policy Institute, a professor emeritus at Stanford University and past president of the American Educational Research Association. Dr. Darling-Hammond led President Obama's education policy transition team in 2008 and did the same for President Biden in 2020. In addition to leading the Learning Policy Institute, she also leads California's State Board of Education. And with more than 600 publications to her name, many of which are award winning books, it's perhaps no surprise that she's often cited as the nation's most influential educator. Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond, welcome to Remaking Tomorrow. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. It's our honor to have you here. And we could spend this entire episode reading your bio and listing your accomplishments in education and education policy. So let's start with what's driving it all. What keeps you up at night and what gets you out of bed the next morning to do it all over again? For whatever set of reasons, you know, I am really driven to see that every young person gets uh, an empowering education that really enables them to own the knowledge, use their talents and interests and the resources around us to make a difference in the world in whatever way is unique to them. I've had that privilege myself. Education was very important in my family and viewed not just as an upwardly mobile path, but as the path to actualization. And I think that's just critically important for human life as well as for our society and for the well-being of every individual child. So what keeps me up at night is how do we get there? There are so many barriers, particularly in this society, that are equity barriers to uh, accomplishing those goals, but also barriers in the way that we have conceptualized education and its purposes and the way it operates that on the one hand can stand in the way of children really finding their path to their futures. Uh, And on the other hand, when organized properly can really be the springboard to a productive future. Uh, So I worry about every aspect of that just about every day. You began your career as a public school teacher yourself. So can you tell us what was your experience like in the classroom and how has that helped shape the trajectory of your career? Right out of college, I taught in big warehouse factory model high schools. I student taught in Camden, New Jersey, and then substitute taught in Philadelphia and taught in a close in uh, desegregating community there. And I experienced that teaching in a way that was both exhilarating because, you know, teaching is some of the most exciting and creative work you can do, and also deeply disturbing. And I learned three things in those experiences that really stuck with me. One of the things I learned is that resources for education are dramatically inequitable in how they are allocated. When I was in Camden, New Jersey, which was the subject of 30 years of lawsuits against the state for inequitable education spending and funding. There were no books in the book room. There were very few materials available to students and teachers. At that time in New Jersey, you know, the places like Princeton and New Brunswick, you know, spent twice or three times as much as the lower funded districts, which included all of the cities that were at that time predominantly black and increasingly now also Latinx. So that was a very profound experiential lesson. The second thing I learned was that the big warehouse factory model high school was not designed to allow me to be accountable and supportive to all of my students. So, you know, in the typical six period day with 30 kids per period as was the norm then you could care deeply about your students but you could never care effectively for 180 students at one time i was in a context where i did not get to plan with other teachers around a shared group of students there was no collaborative planning or learning time for the teachers There were no systems like advisory systems that allowed kids to have a touch point every day with a caring adult who could know them well 
The third thing that really was clear to me was that I was really underprepared as a teacher for the kind of practice I wanted to be able to engage in and the kind of learning needs I wanted to be able to meet. I was unprepared to work with students who in high school did not yet know really how to read. I was unprepared for students, you know, who were English learners. I was unprepared for really figuring out how to solve the learning puzzles that, you know, every classroom has. So the whole question about how you actually understand and transmit a knowledge base and a skill base to teachers was also one that I put on my agenda. Linda, your path has led from classroom teacher to presidential advisor, and you've just shared with us some poignant lessons learned about your time as a teacher. So what was it that you wanted to accomplish when you first left the classroom and turned your attention to research? I wanted to solve some of these problems. The first one that I really tackled was uh, school finance reform. I went to graduate school at Temple University in the urban education department. I did my dissertation on the inequalities in funding in Pennsylvania. I did a quantitative analysis of what predicts student achievement from among public school expenditures and resources like teachers worked, as I said, at the Education Law Center, uh, and then went off to do additional work on school finance at the National Urban Coalition. And so, you know, one of the things I found, of course, is that money does make a difference. There was a view at a moment in time that maybe it didn't, but that how you spend it makes a difference. And in fact, the more you can spend money on well-qualified, experienced, stable teachers, the better kids do, and the kids who benefit the most are those who were furthest behind to begin with. We've had litigation in state after state around this. You know, every state has its state bird, its state flag, and its state school finance lawsuit. And uh, I was an expert witness in many of those over the course of many years trying to bring the evidence base to bear on those decisions. We've had some successes, but we still have a long way to go. But once you even get equitable resources in place, as some states have managed to do, there's still the question about how do you get high quality teaching? And when I was at the RAND Corporation, we were looking at this question. It was the era when many states were mandating minimum competency tests and certain kinds of highly prescribed curriculum and found that the best teachers were saying that that prohibited them from meeting students' needs because they were on a very standardized, prescribed approach and kids don't learn in standardized ways. Uh, And so this idea that you could somehow have remote control of teaching, as Lee Shulman once put it, and you would get what students need is a deeply flawed idea. That led us then to getting into the question of how do you create a teaching profession and organize a way for teachers to access a very complex knowledge base that they use in making individualized decisions for students who are learning, coming from different backgrounds, coming with different interests and needs. How do you uh, prepare teachers to do that? Uh, And so with my colleague Art Wise at the RAND Corporation, Art created the Center for the Study of the Teaching Profession. Together, we started to look at what could be done around both policy and practice to support preparation, to support the kind of ongoing professional learning that teachers need, to create the kinds of resources that enable them to meet the needs of each and every child. And what you see in the evidence is that when that happens, you see substantial gains in student learning and achievement, as well as teacher satisfaction and willingness to stay in the profession. And then the other piece of the puzzle that I took up in my research was when I went to New York at Columbia Teachers College, and I began to see schools that had been recently redesigned by creative people in that district, like Debbie Meyer and Cece Cunningham and a variety of others who responded to an opportunity to remake education. And they were invited to create new school designs. And in that period of time in the 1990s, hundreds of new small schools were created in New York. And they were organized around project-based learning and around personalized approaches to education in high schools with these advisory systems and other support systems for kids. They used portfolios of student work as a means to both engage them and infuse rigor and standards into the process Uh, as part of graduation. I was able to study and uh, help in the redesign of some of those schools and carried some of that research forward to the work I have since been able to do in California. 
So I want to push on one phrase you just used, and that was policy and practice. You have had a distinguished career as a researcher, to say the least. You've written any number of influential reports, and yet your focus has consistently been on putting that research into practice. What do you think accounts for the divide between the two? In your opinion, what do you see as the major barriers between research and practice being? You know, interestingly, there was a time in the early 1900s when the National Education Association involved all of the players in education and the American Educational Research Association included practitioners as well as researchers. Somewhere around, I guess, the 40s or 50s, the field became very fragmented and everybody joined their own associations, you know, administrators over here and teachers over there and researchers in another corner. What I've seen in some other countries is a much more integrated approach to conducting research and to bringing researchers and practitioners together on a regular basis to learn and inquire together. We also have a very politicized education system. So policy is driven quite often by politics rather than by knowledge and research. And so, you know, we have to build bridges across these enterprises. We've got to train up people who are bridge spanners between research and policy, between research and practice. I love working with people who have been teachers in the classroom or who have been teachers, school administrators, have had other roles, who've been involved in policy and come to get their PhDs to learn about the knowledge base uh, and who leave that experience then as natural bridge spanners. We don't have journals that are clinical journals in the United States as they do in some places. In Shanghai, China, teachers are really meant to be researchers. They learn how to do research about practice. They have research journals. They work with other university-based researchers sometimes as well. We've got to build that culture in which we understand teaching, not as being a stop on the factory assembly line where teachers are asked to stamp students with prescribed lessons, but that teachers are professional experts. They are also themselves always, in one sense, inquiring and researching what's going on, what worked, what didn't work, and they give them the time and the tools to be more expansive with that work. We've got to understand uh, research as being not just to feed the ivory tower or the journal mechanisms. We've got to bring those together in lots of ways that we haven't yet done. This is Greg Baer along with Ryan Rudzeski. We're talking with Linda Darling-Hammond professor emeritus at Stanford University, head of California State Board of Education, and education advisor to Presidents Obama and Biden. Linda, in 2015, you retired from Stanford, but in so many ways you were just getting started. You founded, and you continue to lead, the Learning Policy Institute, bridging our knowledge of what we're learning about learning and putting it into practice. So tell us more about the Institute and what the Institute is doing. As you said, the name of the Institute sort of suggests its purpose, that we want to take what's known about learning and teaching and about how to design uh, productive school organizations and how to manage those organizations into the policy arena. But we work to both do research. We also assemble and synthesize the research that many other people have done because there's a huge knowledge base, of course, about any policy question you could imagine. We try to organize those around the policy questions that policymakers have so that it's really responsive to what they have asked to know and want to know and need to know. Uh, We work with the organizations that represent those constituencies, and we work directly with the folks who are trying to make good policy in many states uh, all across the country, as well as at the federal level. Uh, And, you know, we've seen the ways in which research can really make a difference. We find that policymakers are quite hungry to know what will work, and they need to be able to access folks who can help them quickly uh, and readily gain access to the information that can build better early childhood systems inform the way in which we allocate funding for community schools, preparing and recruiting and retaining teachers and school administrators who can function in ways that produce equitable and empowering education for kids. So 2020 comes around, the pandemic hits, and suddenly it seemed to me like more leaders are looking to the Learning Policy Institute than ever. Personally, I've been aware of your work for a few years, but in 2020, I felt like I started seeing it everywhere. 
And you put out a number of reports and policy recommendations that even now leaders are grappling with and working to implement in their own ways. And I want to ask you about one of those policy recommendations, and that is redesigning schools for stronger relationships. Can you tell us a bit more what you mean by that and what makes that a priority when we think about building back better? You know, we inherited these factory model schools from the early 1900s get the kids on the conveyor belt and then stamp them with a lesson, send them from one teacher to another in each grade level. And we adopted the Prussian age grading system. We adopted the platoon system, which is not the way that some countries have organized their schools, where many times the same teacher stays with the same students for two years or three years, or in some systems as many as six years where teachers in high school may teach multiple subjects and see the same students for multiple periods of time. And then, of course, we've had, particularly in high-need communities, very high dropout rates from those factory model schools. So that's not going to work for us. And we learned in the pandemic that relationships really matter. I think a good thing that came out of that experience is that there's much more appreciation and understanding that we need a whole child perspective, that we need to understand how to support kids socially and emotionally, as well as academically. We have a lot of research now that shows that when you do support kids socially and emotionally, their academic uh, achievement goes up. Graduation rates go up. They feel more attached to school. They are uh, able to learn in ways that are uh, more effective. I've seen many, many, many schools, and LPI has documented many of them, who are redesigned in ways that, for example, have a team of teachers who might share 100 or 120 students. They get time to plan together around the students as well as around the content area which can include interdisciplinary projects and ways of learning that are more coherent. Students have these advisories every day in a school that I helped to found, which uh, was in a community that's uh, virtually 100% students of color, low income. We had an advisory every day in the morning and one at the end of the day for students where they would come in, they would be in a group of 15 to 20 students with a teacher, They could get breakfast there. They would touch base. If there were any traumas or needs, those could surface and the student could get the help they need or be sent to a resource that might help them with what might have happened in their lives. But in addition, the teacher would just hold circles for kids to share with each other, teach social and emotional competencies, check in with them. And then at the end of the day, they'd return to advisory for a brief period of time to see how the day went. Were there any bubbling needs or crises? How were they doing in getting their work in? Did they need to go to after school support to get an assignment done or to get some additional tutoring? That's one model. Uh, I've seen it in many, many places where people have designed for relationships in our schools where the kids always know there is someone who knows them. That advisor, by the way, is also the connection to the parents, to the family. The teacher-student family conferences that are held multiple times in the year can be held by that advisor, and it transforms education. And the outcomes that can occur in a setting where kids are well-supported and well-known are much, much different and much better than what happens when you leave kids out there to make their way through a complicated system and sink or swim. Linda, thinking about relationship-centered schools makes me think about a quotation of Fred Rogers that Ryan and I often cite. He said, we all long to know that we're loved and capable of loving. I think, like Fred, you share a whole child perspective. And in that context, the Learning Policy Institute also recommends supporting community schools. And now that's an idea that was gaining traction before COVID, and by many accounts, they're even more necessary today. So can you tell us a little bit about what community schools are and what you see as their potential. Community schools are intended to support children in every way and to be a hub of the community so that a fully formed community school, if you will, will typically offer pathways. They may even offer on site services like health care and mental health services and social services, or they will be able to connect to those in the community. They will be connected to a lot of community-based organizations, which may be part of those services, as well as after-school and before-school care, and quite often, you know, recreational services and other youth development opportunities. 
They should be connected to the mayor's office and to the Boys and Girls Club. They may offer additional services to family members, English language proficiency courses or, you know, after school financial literacy uh, opportunities. But then the rather part of what they do is to create a collaborative environment inside the school with all of these different professionals and with teachers themselves and create the social and emotional supports and opportunities for relationship-centered schooling that I just described so that the child is known well and supported well in every aspect of their lives. And it acknowledges the very important role of families and community support providers in that process. Linda, we can't close our conversation without mentioning another major milestone in your career. So in September 2022, you received the Yidan Prize, which is the world's largest prize in education. Can you tell us a little bit about the Ed Prep Lab, which is the organization which you helped co-found and to which you've dedicated your prize? Thank you so much for mentioning that. The Yidan Prize was a huge surprise. Uh, It's one of those things where you get a call. Uh, In this case, it was from a number in Hong Kong that I... (laughs) wasn't even sure if I should pick it up. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, they say, oh, you've, you've won this amazing prize, which does come with uh, both the opportunity to uh, interact with all of the other prize winners and luminaries, and there's all kinds of collaborative work that they do, but also this cash recognition. And the Ed Prep Lab, we created with a variety of educator preparation institutions, We have a partner in Bank Street College in supporting and managing the work that the institutions are doing to try to integrate the science of learning and development into everything they do to be the ongoing pioneers and cutting edge leaders around what it means to prepare teachers deeply and well for this kind of practice. But we also have policy partners in the Ed Prep Lab who are in state agencies and state boards and governor's offices and legislative partners and others who really help us think about the kinds of policies that will support teachers learning from, you know, soup to nuts from beginning of the career through the process of becoming expert practitioners. The Ed Prep Lab is really a research policy practice lab, if you will, where we're trying to both develop the practice and figure out with our colleagues how to support it at scale. Linda, how can people find out more about you and the work you're doing? Well, one place is to go to the learningpolicyinstitute.org, where we have a lot of resources of the sort we've been talking about here, and uh, they can see a little bit about what we're doing right there. Before we go, just one last question, Linda. What's one thing that parents and educators can do today to make tomorrow a more promising place for every learner? Well, one thing that parents and educators can do is, you know, be in close touch with one another (laughs) and with others who share their goals to collaborate. It's so very important that we create a collaborative context in every school where families who are the first teachers of every child and their current instructors and support providers are working together on behalf of each child. The African proverb that I really value the most says, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And we need parents and educators to go far together with the work they do on each child's behalf and then the work they do together to transform schools. Thanks again to Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond president and CEO of the Learning Policy Institute and winner of the 2022 Yidan Prize for Education. Remaking Tomorrow is powered by Remake Learning. Learn more at remakelearning.org.